River Crane in West London is home to a small colony of Britain's fastest declining mammal, the water vole. Like many urban rivers, the crane has been heavily modified over the years, reducing its natural form and function. Many sections have been straightened, widened or diverted into concrete channels in well-meaning attempts to reduce flood risk. Human activity has also had a detrimental effect on water quality. But despite these pressures, and also the disturbance caused by the noise and bustle of a busy urban setting, the crane is home to a remarkably wide range of plants and animals. Over the past decade and a half, a concerted effort has been made to restore the river to a cleaner and more natural state so that this precious ecosystem can support species that might otherwise disappear altogether. One such species is the water vole, Arvicola amphibious, which was once common on the crane but is now thought to be restricted to just a handful of sites in the lower river valley. I set out with the permission of London Wildlife Trust to film water voles at their local nature reserve, Crane Park Island. So I'm on an exciting mission today. I've come to a secret location where there are water voles to put out some camera traps and monitor the populations here. We found some feeding signs and some latrines. So we've set up some camera traps to try and capture the water voles on camera. Worryingly, a few weeks ago, I found some mink footprints nearby. So we're also going to put some cameras on the river and make sure there are no mink or try and find out if there are mink here. We've also got floating raft traps to catch mink footprints and monitor if they're here as well. Mink are bad news for water voles, so it's really important that we detect them early um, and control them um, so that they don't wipe out these local vulnerable populations of voles. Camera traps are a highly effective and non-invasive way of monitoring such a shy species. And there are plenty of signs of water vole presence at this location. Burrows and runs along the banks of the channels and streams. Some have obvious feeding signs just outside, where voles have been nibbling bankside vegetation, in this case celandine. Cut stems are often seen floating outside of burrows, with their characteristic 45 degree angle bite marks. In some locations, neat piles of freshly harvested and chewed stems can be found, a good place to set a camera. Their diet is varied, ranging from reeds, nettles, sedges and a lot of other waterside plant species. Footprints can be seen on muddy runs and these often lead to latrine or toilet sites. Water vole droppings can be distinguished from other rodents like rats by their shape, size, colour and lack of distinctive odour. Picking up on these feeding, burrowing and toileting signs is a good way of monitoring habitat suitability, water vole distribution and abundance. It's two weeks since I last came to set some camera traps for water voles. And I'm back today to check and see if we've got any footage. Pretty exciting. It's on with the waders and off to check traps. It's important that these sensitive habitats and species are disturbed as little as possible. So I visited with special permission and a knowledgeable local guide every three to four weeks to retrieve and review my footage. The first hopeful discovery turned out to be brown rats, a species commonly confused with water voles when it occurs in aquatic habitats. Swimming rats sit low in the water with their pointed head and prominent ears protruding, a contrast with the rounded features of voles. They also have a more bare tail than the fur covered tail of a water vole. And then we struck gold water voles started to appear. Buoyant swimmers with a rounded face and barely visible ears. They were mainly out in the very early morning or at night. This colony is thought to have survived a previous mink appearance on the crane due to the habitat complexity here. Unlike a straight stream or river that allows a mink to visit every burrow in sequence, the complex channels, reed beds and water bodies on this reserve meant that escaping mink predation was easier for these voles. And so they've clung on. Here's a rat again. See the difference? The splash or plop of an alarmed water vole can also indicate their presence. These ones were startled by moorhens. To monitor for the reappearance of North American mink on the crane, volunteers regularly check floating mink rafts near the water's edge, which will capture footprints of any animals passing through them. A tray of wet clay inside can be inspected for vole, rat or mink footprints. Throughout the summer, plenty of adult water voles were captured on camera and we found promising signs they were extending their range up and down river from the reserve. But the question remained, were they breeding here successfully? 
with fragmented or isolated populations, inbreeding can become a problem and lead to colonies dying out. Here's one eating flag iris. Have a listen. Another with a nettle. And reeds were a firm favourite. They also collected fluffy reed tops, presumably for bedding inside their burrow systems. And the cameras showed up lots of other wildlife too. Here a pair of moorhens mating, not something you see every day. Blink and you'll miss this next clip of a kingfisher. I've slowed it down so you can have another look. This odd sound is a mystery to many, but it's the distinctive call of the marsh frog. And excitingly, we got great views of Chetty's warbler, a skulking and elusive reedbed specialist. Also, a glimpse or two of shy reed warblers. And one distant view of a grass snake attracting the attention of a curious moorhen. Wood mouse, the third rodent species detected. Wrens aplenty. Mallards. Mallard ducklings and a female mandarin duck. And then we noticed a very busy adult vole and burrow system back and forth constantly when finally we spotted a juvenile water vole. Two juvenile water voles in fact. A really promising sign that the future of water voles on the river crane is looking up. But it is by no means guaranteed and currently a team led by Richmond Parks Department are investigating how best to protect and enhance this local population of one of our most precious and threatened native mammals.